This presentation is going to be on the factors that modulate post-activation potentiation. So what is post-activation potentiation? In other words, PAP. Well, it's this relatively new phenomenon that strength coaches are utilizing to acutely improve their clients or athletes' power performances in movements <clears throat> such as sprinting, jumping, or throwing. And it can be summed up as or defined as the process in which acute muscle force output is enhanced via its contractile history. And it's theorized that the way in which PAP can work is to performing non-fatiguing muscle contractions at a high load, low duration, then resting for a brief interval, and then performing a power exercise in the hopes that we're going to see improved muscle performance within uh, this subsequent exercise. Before going into the factors that influence PAP, I want to briefly go over its physiological mechanisms, and then after this slide, I'll review the most common method used to induce this process. So for the physiology, there are two proposed mechanisms. The first suggests that the initial exercise performed causes the phosphorylation of myosin, myosin regulatory light chains via the myosin light chain kinase enzyme. And what this will do is cause our muscle filaments to be more sensitive to calcium ions. That increased sensitivity allows for more calcium to bind to troponin, thus allowing for more attachment sites at cross bridges, which in return is going to enhance tension. Also, it's been suggested that the way this enzyme phosphorylates, it can alter the myosin molecule in a way that it causes an increase in the rate of cross bridge cycles. So all in all, we have enhanced muscle force and rate of force development. In other words, our power production is increased. The second me mechanism suggests that PAP is caused by enhan an enhanced neural response, either from an increase in alpha motor neuron excitability or a decrease in presynaptic inhibition of the afferent neuron. So again, being able to enhance muscle force and rate of force development. The way we can examine this is through observing the H reflex. So if we induce PAP procedures on an individual and then observe an increase in the amplitude of the H reflex, then we can deduce that the enhancement occurred from the enhanced neural response. Uh, but research in the late 90s found positive re results for this mechanism, but more recent research in the 21st century has provided conflicting results, so this method remains controversial and needs further investigations. So the typical method used to induce PAP is complex training, and it can be defined as the execution of a high load resistance exercise prior to performing a ballistic movement with similar biomechanical characteristics. So to provide an example, you could perform a barbell back squat at or below your six rep max, rest for a designated time interval, and then e execute five counter movement jumps. And so the goal here is to acutely increase, or in other words, potentiate the subsequent exercise, which in our case was those counter movement jumps. And research shows that this method has been seen to be useful for enacting PAP in individuals so they can acutely enhance their power performances. However, the key word there being acutely. There is yet to be enough studies conducted to determine if individuals can develop any sort of long-term adaptations from chronic exposure to PAP. And so these are just this is just an outline of the factors I'm going to be going over. So there's two individual factors their muscle fiber composition and training level, and then three procedural factors for um, when we're looking at the complex training protocol. So the exercise loads, uh, primarily looking at the first exercise, the rest interval between the two exercises, and then the selection of both the first and the subsequent exercise. When looking at the type of exercises performed in complex training, you'll notice that there is a high need for force, speed, and power under a short period of time. And what muscle fibers are associated with those kinds of movements? Well, fast twitch fibers or type 2 fibers. Thus, in theory, if an individual possessed more of these fibers, then they'd be able to display a greater PAP response. And this was evident in uh, two studies, one of which found that subjects who had more type 2 fibers and their knee extensors exhibited greater PAP responses than those with a lesser amount. And the other study indicated that fast twitch fibers undergo more phosphorylation than slow twitch fibers. 
thus suggesting by having an increase in fast twitch fibers, you'll have an increased ability to produce uh, a greater PAP response. When looking at individual training levels, uh, researchers found that highly trained or trained individuals have better abilities in producing greater PAP responses when compared to untrained individuals. And often in those studies observed, the untrained subjects weren't even able to produce a response at all, and in effect unable to improve their performances. So why would someone's training level determine their ability to induce PAP? Well, the response to this lies in the fact that untrained individuals typically possess less strength, meaning they struggle to balance fatigue and potentiation. So to help further illustrate that, uh, when an untrained individual completes that high load conditioning activity, they'll typically fatigue and be unable to potentiate their performance in the subsequent exercise. Whereas trained and stronger individuals are more fatigue resistant, and therefore more capable of exhibiting PAP. <clears throat> in terms of the exercise loads, uh, like I said earlier, we're primarily concerned with the first exercise load, which is also known as the conditioning activity. And remembering back to the complex training slide, it's theorized that this should be performed at a high load. But research has remained mixed on whether or not that is true, and so researchers, researchers have yet to be able to define an optimal load for maximizing results. When studies attempted to observe the difference between a high and low load conditioning activity, the current theory of needing a high load withstood. However, when studies observed a high versus moderate load conditioning activity, the results were not as conclusive. Some studies found that when subjects performed a moderate load at slightly higher reps and or more sets, they could produce just as well, if not a better response, than the high load conditioning activity. Therefore, based off of this, further research should explore the influence of the conditioning activity's volume to determine if a moderate load could truly have similar or better results when compared to a higher load. And then one more thing I want to add before I move on is one of those high versus moderate load studies found that yes, both loads could produce positive responses, but their stronger subjects produce greater results under their high load condition. Thus, this warrants more research on the correlations between the magnitude or volume of loads and the relative strength and training levels of individuals. So to further, to further expand on the need of that type of research, um, we can look at this study done by Kwame and colleagues in 2009. What they did was vary the volume of the conditioning activity by changing up the reps of one set of an 85% one arm back squat. And they, it should be noted that they used recreationally trained men for their subjects. And so what their results showed was that these subjects weren't able to potentiate their vertical jumps with that high of a load at any of the volumes. So this begs the question to whether well, what would have happened if this type of population maybe used a lower, more moderate load at similar or higher reps? Would it have helped them balance the fatigue and potentiation better? Well, further research is obviously going to be needed uh, to fully answer these questions. The rest interval between the two exercises performed is a crucial component to PAP because we have to perform our subsequent exercise in a timely manner. So not only can we utilize those physiological mechanisms, but at the same time, we can avoid fatiguing from the conditioning activity. <clears throat> Meaning, if we perform the potentiating exercise too early, then we're likely to have a decrease in performance due to the fatigue provided by the conditioning activity. And so that fatigue is basically overriding our ability to potentiate. But conversely, if we wait too long to perform our subsequent exercise, then we're likely to diminish our chance of using those physiological mechanisms. And essentially what we're doing here is just resting and not potentiating. So we're not going to see a change in performance, and in some cases, uh, a rest interval that long was seen to have negative effects on performance. So is there an optimal rest interval? Uh, the quick answer to this, no. 
But the long answer is that there are just way too many individual and procedural factors that are going to influence PAP. So it's pretty hard for researchers to determine a one-size-fits-all rest interval since studies will often have different methodologies. And so not only is this going to affect their results, but it's going to affect how we can interpret their results. So let's take these two studies for example. Uh, the first one found 8 and 12 minutes to be the most effective when compared to shorter and longer periods, but the second one determined 4 minutes was better for their subjects and no improvements were made with 8 and 12 minutes. So why did they differ? Well, for starters, looking at their subjects, the first study used pro-male rugby players, whereas the latter used male subjects who only needed to have at least 3 years of lifting experience. And I know what you might be thinking. Well, wait, I thought you said earlier that athletically trained and stronger individuals are going to be more fatigue resistant. Wouldn't those subjects in the first study be able to handle a short rest, short rest interval, like four minutes? Well, to answer your amazing question, uh, these conflicting results can be uh, attributed to their different methods for choosing their conditioning activity. So the first study used only a high load conditioning activity, whereas the second one used a low, moderate, and high. So that's why maybe the first study's athletes couldn't potentiate during the shorter rest interval, because they might have been fatiguing from that high load conditioning activity, and then vice versa for the second study. So if we can't define an optimal rest interval for everyone, what can we do? Well, at the minimum, for now, we can at least define some generalizations for different populations. And what I found was that there is a lot of research for highly trained athletes, and they all found positive results within the range of 4 to 12 minutes. So some of the studies found 8 and 12 to work, others indicating 4 and 6, you know, another one 10 minutes, etc. So yes, these have a large range of what can work, but it can be a good starting point for those in this population trying to figure out what will work best for them. But strength coaches aren't always going to be working with that type of population. Sometimes they work with recreationally trained and or weaker individuals. However, the research just isn't there yet to formulate an evident generalization, hence why this one is an asterisk. Uh, the best I could find was that Joe and colleagues concluded from their results that weaker, recreationally trained individuals might require uh, longer rest intervals, around 15 to 20 minutes, when compared to stronger individuals who can maybe withstand a shorter interval. interval. And so this logically makes sense, right? Because the longer rest interval is going to help them balance the fatigue and potentiation better So, because they're less fatigue resistant. Uh, the type of exercise we select for both the conditioning activity and the potentiating activity are going to have an effect on PAP. And remembering back to the complex training uh, definition, they theoretically need to be biomechanically similar. And to illustrate why, a study demonstrated this concept by looking at what a back squat could or could not potentiate. They found that counter movement jumps, uh, counter movement jump performance was increased, but sprinting and sled times had no significant differences. So the authors concluded that exercises should possess similar uh, movement patterns in order to induce PAP. And when looking at these pictures, we can sort of see why uh, sprinting and sled pushing contain more so a horizontal propulsion component when compared to squatting and jumping, which are primarily vertical tasks. Alright, so before I move on, I want to note that PAP can enhance upper body performance, but the focus of the remainder of this section is going to be on lower leg performances that can be potentiated. So on this slide, I'm going to go over jumping, and the next one I'll go over sprinting. So for jumping, without a doubt, the best method or most backed by research method is going to be the use of a back squat for the conditioning activity. However, it might not be the only viable method. So recently, researchers have been examining the use of a plyometric warm-up <clears throat> as a conditioning activity. And what results found was that both unweighted and weighted box jumps around 10 to 20% could improve performance. And it should be noted that no differences were seen between the two. 
But uh, furthermore, even a meta-analysis concluded that plyos could outperform traditional complex training methods of using a high or moderate resistance activity. Thus, future research should not only further uh, examine weighted versus unweighted plyometrics, but whether a plyometric warm-up as a whole, in other words, a low to no load conditioning activity, could truly outperform a heavy resistance exercise because that would completely challenge the traditional complex training belief of needing a heavy load conditioning activity. And in terms of another resistance exercise that could potentiate jumping, uh, the deadlift has been observed by researchers. However, the results uh, remain mixed, so more research is obviously needed to come to a more decisive conclusion. In terms of potentiating sprinting performance, the use of a back squat as the conditioning activity might not be as effective in improving performance since the biomechanical similarities are just not as prevalent as they are for jumping. Hence why we see research currently remains mixed on this. And as the theme continues for this presentation, more research is needed. And so since sprinting doesn't really relate to the majority of traditional weightlifting exercises, researchers have looked to examine alternate conditioning activity methods that would have better movement specificity to sprinting, such as heavy-weighted sled pushing, which to date I could only find one article that observed this, but the results were positive. And then sled towing has also been observed since this essentially is just a form of resistance for sprinting, so in theory this would be the best one, right? Well, it doesn't quite appear that way. So when we're looking at this, um, you can see in green and red, there were an equal number of studies that indicated towards it working and not working. <clears throat> and then to make things even more confusing, I've now added a yellow color as this represents articles which showed both positive and negative indications. So what I mean by that is looking at this first one in yellow, they noticed that there were improvements, but only during the acceleration phase of a 30, minute, 30 meter sprint. And then the others showed it could improve 40-yard dash times, but the same improvements were also seen with an unresisted sprint conditioning activity, or in other words, just sprinting as a warm-up. So overall, it appears that there are some potential benefits, but I really think more research is needed to confidently say it is a truly uh, an effective conditioning activity for improving sprinting performance. And then lastly, a plyometric conditioning activity has shown promising results and may be the best option in terms of supporting evidence and lack of unsupportive evidence. So the exercises of choice were depth jumps and alternate leg bounding. And like the jumping plyos, weighted and unweighted trials were shown to be able to produce positive results. So again, consequently, uh, more research is needed to expand on this to challenge the original idea of needing a high load conditioning activity for lower leg performance. All right, so I just went over a whole bunch of information and sources, but what are the overall implications and take home, message, take home messages we can make about PAP? Well, first off, it is something that has a wide variety of variables, both individual and procedural. But despite all of those factors, there was an ample amount of resources that suggested yes, PAP can acutely enhance our performance in power-based activities such as jumping and sprinting. However, the application of acute performance enhancement may be practical for track and field athletes, but it isn't too practical for most sport athletes. For example, a running back won't be able to perform a heavy back squat before a snap, or a basketball player isn't going to be able to do plyometrics during a timeout. Thus, additional long-term research that would track the progression of subjects for weeks or months is needed to see if continual PAP exposure can lead to long-term adaptations on power production so we can understand if this phenomenon really has high practicality. But at the moment, those types of long-term studies are going to be very difficult to conduct since there are a myriad of factors that influence PAP. And so we've yet to be able to pinpoint an optimal procedure for maximizing results. So what's the best possible way we can attempt to ensure that the individual we're working with can display PAP? Well, at the minimum for now, what we can do is have them follow some sort of set guidelines 
that have been constructed based on previous research. So since highly trained athletes are more fatigue resistant, a high load conditioning activity with a short to moderate rest interval might work best for them. But I also want to see more research on moderate and low low conditioning activities specifically within this population to see if that high load is indeed the best option for them. For the lesser trained and weaker population, a moderate to lower load conditioning activity with a longer rest interval might be better for them so they can help balance that fatigue and potentiation. However, extensive research on lower, lo uh, lower loads and longer rest intervals is going to be needed in order to make those assumptions. And then one more thing to add about all of this is, at the end of the day, not only are these rest intervals within these large and vague ranges, but also everyone reacts differently. So realistically, the best method might be to just do trial and error with yourself or clients. Lastly, when <clears throat> trying to select the right exercises, the activity we're trying to potentiate is going to determine the type of conditioning activity we want to utilize because the biomechanical similarities between the two performances appear to be an important factor. So to illustrate, we want to potentiate jumping. Back squats without a doubt are going to be our go-to, but they may not be as useful for sprinting due to the movement differences. And for both jumping and sprinting, plyometrics, when the exercise is obviously specific to those respective uh, performances, can be a useful conditioning activity. And it may be more so the best option for sprinting, since sprinting doesn't relate very well to uh, most weightlifting exercises. And then lastly, sled towing remains mixed, so more research is needed on that. And I would really like to see more research on sled pushing, since I feel there is a lot of promise there. But other than that, that is everything I wanted to cover. And these are the resources that I use for this entire presentation.